Well, hello everyone. Happy Hump Day. My name is Paula Teslis. I'm the manager of communications here at Demonstrated Success. And thank you for joining us after probably what has been a long day's work uh, for adventures in asynchronous learning, flipping the classroom. We are lucky enough to have almost 250 educators on today from coast to coast, uh, but primarily here in New England, um, where we are, which is Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Before we get into the meat of today's presentation, I'd like to take just a couple minutes and tell you a little bit more about who we are and about our new remote learning PD support program. And if we could go ahead to the next slide. We're there. Uh, one more, please. There we go. Thank you. So Demonstrated Success is a K-12 education consulting company. Like I said, we're um, based in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We have broad experience in professional development, whether it be on-site in school, through workshops, or just as we are now in remote instruction. We also provide statewide IT development. But for the purpose of today, I just wanted to let you know about our professional development offerings. And those focus, like I said, they're very broad, but in the areas of ELA and math curriculum, culture and climate initiatives. We are doing work on behalf of the state of New Hampshire for data, data informed instruction across the state. And most recently work supporting educators through remote learning initiatives. This past spring, we reached over 30,000 educators in New Hampshire with our professional development offerings. If we could go to the next slide. Thank you. And that is what inspired our new remote learning professional development program. And what it includes is twice a week, we will offer webinars through our professional development coaches. We have both an educator program and a family program. For those educators, webinars will be on topics such as tools and strategies for collaborating with co-teachers, Para, paraprofessionals and specialists, and planning for performance assessments and project-based learning in a remote setting. Each webinar will include an actual, actionable classroom challenge. It's important that you are able to practice what you learn, and so we'll send you off with something fun to practice. You'll also receive a vetted resource list with important articles that are customized for you from our professional development coaches. We make ourselves available through weekly office hours, probably taking place Tuesdays and Thursdays, where you'll be able to ask questions that pertain to any of the webinars and topics that have been reviewed with our coaches. Also important are community conversations that will take place in special interest areas, such as supporting ELL students, or supporting students with executive functioning challenges. So those are some examples of our program as it relates to educators. There's also a separate program available for families because we know it's more important than ever to connect with them and make them instructional partners. It will follow a very similar format with webinars, resources, office hours, and uh, the content will be specific to them it will include instructional programming, such as simple activities to improve your child's fluency in decoding, and also provide them technological support around things like Google Classroom and Seesaw. If you're interested in learning more about our professional development packages, I'll close at the end of today's presentation with a few next steps. But for now, I think that uh, you've all been very patient in listening to me, and I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Karen Matzo, here at Demonstrating Success. Hello, all. It's nice to see you. Oh, not really see you, but be with you. Um, we're happy to have you here today. I am incredibly excited for this webinar because Carolyn Berenson is a fantastic presenter 
and a highly intelligent professional. And I'm very excited to hear from her today. She's the owner of iPedagogy, which is a company that she started a couple of years ago, um, which is based in New Hampshire. And Carolyn started out as a special educator and um, transitioned into technology and using technology for remote instruction and, um, and, and for those purposes. And um, she also teaches at SNHU in their School of Education as an adjunct. And she's, she's doing a lot of work around New England and she's a very busy lady. So we're happy to have her today. And I am Karen, the Professional Development Director at DS. Um, I am a literacy specialist, an RTI coordinator, a special education teacher. I specialize in data and assessment and, and all sorts of important areas. So without much further ado, I'm going to hand you off to Carolyn. And um, do you want to next slide, Carolyn? We are going to, everyone's muted, okay, but feel free to use the chat box. Okay, and I will be monitoring the chat box with all of your questions, which we will go through as the webinar um, moves through. Um, what else? We are going to, I am going to turn off my video and um, that way you can focus on the slides and it also reduces the demands on the, on the bandwidth. This webinar is recorded. It will be shared with you along with all of the handouts and the slides and everything will be made available to you after, so don't worry if you have missed something. And I wanted to call your attention to the handouts pay, um, on your control panel on the right-hand side, right? At the bottom, you can see that there's a chat, and if you'd like to, you know, feel free to chat in there. Right above that, you should see a section, a drop-down titled Handouts, and there's two documents in there. There's a certificate of completion, and then there's also a resource list that Carolyn put together. So feel free to access those. As you move up the control panel, right, you see that there's a drop down for questions. Feel free to write your questions in there, and I will monitor them. Um, I think that's about it. I'll keep an eye on the attendees. And um, we are gonna keep everyone muted, though, just to avoid any extraneous noise. But if you have a question, write it in, okay? So here we go. Welcome, Carolyn. And um, let's get going. Learn about the flipped classroom. Hi, Karen. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And I also would like to thank Demonstrated Success for inviting me to partner with them on this important series of webinars. Um, we are all very, very concerned about our teachers and education professionals out there and want to provide as much support as possible. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to collaborate. So on that note, um, Karen had um, pointed out to you the handouts um, that are on the bottom right hand side of your control panel. And I did want to let you know that I am going to have you access some links in that resource list during the webinar. So if you want to go ahead and open that up, that will, you'll be ahead of the game. That will be to your advantage. I'm sorry, I, it looked like my mic was turned off. Can everyone hear me now? Karen, can you hear me? I, I can hear you, but okay. I think you, you were muted for a bit. Okay, I'm gonna back up then and just restart. That would be I great. recognize that many of you are here tonight feeling technological, cognitive, and emotional fatigue. You are physically tired from sitting in a hunched position for hours on end, staring into your device and wishing you could reach out and touch your students, not just glimpse them through their tiny allotted screen square. 
You have started the school year with more questions than answers, and at the same time, your students and parents are coming to you with questions for you to answer. You are feeling uncertainty and perhaps some skepticism. When putting together this webinar, I felt all of this and made decisions as such. As an educator and instructional designer, I did not anticipate filling a role helping educators transition to remote learning, which is very different from online learning with its highly evolved ecosystem of supports and pedagogical practices. I recognize, however, that there are some skills and practices that can bridge the two and perhaps help you see some light at the end of the tunnel and rekindle a little of that creative teaching spirit. That's my goal tonight. I'm going to start generally to bring everyone together on common ground. Then we'll move right into more specifics. I've kept things very simple with a few variations on a theme. We'll then delve into a research-based approach and let you practice it a bit. You should walk away this evening or this afternoon with some things, some simple things you can implement right away. So I want to invite you to take a deep breath. This is a respite. It's a time for you to play, imagine, experiment, and grow. And I would like to point out also at this time that portions of this content were developed in collaboration with my dear friend and professional colleague, Dr. Cheryl Sawin, who's the director of the Digital Heritage Program at Temple University. So let's play first. Most educators love to read, and we are always looking for recommendations. What book, fiction or nonfiction, has inspired your teaching practice? You can answer in two ways. You can go to pollev.com forward slash Carolyn Barron 964 in a browser, or you can text Carolyn Barron 964 to 37607 then type in your response. Responses are anonymous and you are allowed one response. So everybody, let's go ahead and think about a book, fiction or nonfiction, that has inspired your teaching practice. And it could be recently or it could be when you first became a teacher. What has inspired you? And my hope is that we can get some recommendations for some exciting new reading that can Carolyn, can you do me a favor? Can no. you put the poll EV link in the chat? I sure can. Or I guess I could if I just copy it. And that will allow people to copy and paste it. Yep. Or you can also right click it to open up the link. Okay, we've got some responses coming in. And I'm excited. I'm already seeing some things that I have not read. And I'm writing these down. Life of Pi, that's wonderful. Mm. Karen, are these new? titles to you as well or have you read yeah. any of these no lots of them let's see i've read teach like a champion yes i've read that one Car you know carol dweck educated oh my goodness i'm seeing some that i have oh. not read Thank you, Mr. Faulkner. <laughs> that's the best. Whole brain teaching, that's a good one. 
Great. Well, I appreciate those of you who responded and we still have some responses coming in. I'm amazed at the diversity of books out there that have inspired education professionals. I really anticipated seeing a lot of Harry Potter. <laughs> Whoever put that in, that, that gave me a chuckle. That's wonderful. Onward, Cultivating Emotional Resilience in Educators. There is a title for all of us to write down right now. Hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. And this will continue to capture responses as they come in, but I thought this might just give us a little bit of time for sharing and developing a little bit of a sense of community. Um, there are 111 of us at the moment, 12, and it can be challenging to create a sense of community, but doing a little poll at the outset can certainly get the ball rolling. So we're going to go ahead and move forward in the webinar. Though most of us tonight know what asynchronous learning is, I am casting a wide net to start just to make sure we're all starting on common ground. Asynchronous learning is a student-centered teaching method widely used in online learning. It can occur in different times and spaces particular to each learner. Instructors usually set up a learning path with which students engage at their own pace. Synchronous learning includes all types in which learners and instructors are in the same place at the same time in order for learning to take place. It can be whole class or smaller groups. Students usually go through the learning path together, accompanied by their instructor. So what makes asynchronous learning powerful? Asynchronous learning leverages the flexible media of technology, which has been proven to increase independence and access for diverse learners. It allows for student-centered pacing as individuals can move through chunks of learning at a pace that works for them. They can repeat engagement with content as often as they want in a modality that works for them. Asynchronous learning, as mentioned, does not require as much bandwidth or rely on just right conditions of time, people, and place to happen. The cognitive load is less taxing then synchronous learning where individuals must multitask to keep the pace that the instructor sets for the group. Asynchronous learning promotes chunking content learning, which leads to better retention. It values synthesis and reflection by taking the urgency out of the equation. Designing engaging asynchronous learning requires a flip in how we approach the assignment of the stages of learning. Let's take a look. So the idea of the flipped classroom is not new. With the movement toward more student-centered learning, the need to provide more voice and choice resulted in a flipped way of thinking. Instead of introducing foundational knowledge in class, it would be introduced outside of class on a learning platform such as Google Classroom by way of recordings, readings, and other media, or even individual or collaborative activities. And class time, in class time, then became an opportunity for stabilizing, discussing, and extending learnings. The benefits of this gained traction and educators began to take the big leap from a role of purveyors of knowledge to curators of information and guides, allowing students more control over their own learning. Not surprisingly, engagement increased and thinking became more visible when instructors and students gathered together for in-person class time. The flipped classroom is actually a permutation of asynchronous learning, making it a viable methodology during remote learning. Whether you are meeting in person or remotely for the synchronous learning sessions, 
flipping the classroom increases engagement and levels the playing field for our diverse learners. As access becomes more equitable and accommodations aligned for online learning, this will become increasingly the case. So there are three simple steps to flipping the classroom for remote learning. First, create mini lectures of about six to 10 minutes of key concepts and record them for students to watch at home to prep for class. You can do this in three ways. You can curate pre-recorded content from well-known, well-vetted sites such as Ebpuzzle or Khan Academy. You can use available screencasting tools for homemade video, video of you instructing. Or you can use dynamic, easy to create multimedia tools for engaging slide decks. I would like to invite you now to do what I call flooding the chat box with your favorite screencasting tool. So open up the chat box and share what your favorite screencasting tool is with the group. Mine happens to be Loom. And Karen, would you love to share some of those as they come through? I will. I'm just watching for them now. Oh, they're in the questions, and that's okay too. So I see Screencastify, Screencastomatic, Flipgrid, um, Interactive Slides. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Padlet. Hoping, hoping it will be my document reader when it arrives. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have Pear Deck here, that's new, Loom, Google Slides. Nicole, we're gonna hook you up with some ideas. She says she's here to learn about some. Flipgrid. Oh, that's great. Okay, so there's a, a number of great screencasting tools mentioned. I do wanna distinguish between um, Google Slides, which is a tool that can be part of a screencast versus an actual tool that captures video, which you can then, uh, captures and records video, which you can then post. And typical screencasting tools that are in use out there are Loom, that was one I mentioned, and I also heard someone else mention it. Um, I also think I heard Screencast-O-Matic, Screencastify. You can also use um, sync meet tools like Zoom um, and, and Google Hangouts and just record yourself on that. Those can also serve as screencasting tools. So let's go on to step two. Step two to flipped learning is to create opportunities for student collaboration outside of scheduled class time. This can be discussion boards, content creation, inquiry and problem solving, or close reading with annotation. For discussion boards, you can use Flipgrid or Jamboard. For content creation, you can use Adobe Spark. For inquiry and problem solving, you can use Google Explore. And for close reading and annotation, I recommend hypothesis.is. So I'd love to know what your favorite collaborative digital tools are. So again, I'm going to invite you to flood either the question box or the chat box with your favorite collaborative digital tools. Carolyn, the ones that you just named, are they in our resource um, document? They are not, but we can certainly add those to it. Okay, that would be fabulous. I see Jamboard. Um, again, oh, let's see. 
comments on Google Slides. Absolutely. Google I want to just to real quick because folks are um, expressing that they can't see the chat or the questions. So everyone has been writing in their responses to the questions, which is fine. Um, you as attendees in GoToWebinar can't see the questions. Um, I will definitely be recording everything and I will send all of the names to all of these different tools to you. So do not worry. Okay. And the chat is also available for you. It's farther down on your navigation pane. That's great. That's great, Karen, that that can be saved and shared out. Okay, so one of the simplest collaborative tools that you can use that's widely available is just Google Docs, um, where students get together collaboratively and they can use highlighting and commenting features to work off of the Google Doc together. Let's take a look at the third step in creating flipped learning. Carolyn, just I just wanted to put out there, I don't know if you've worked with the tool Parlay at all. I not, but I'd love to hear about it. Okay. There was a question about it. Anyway. I'll write that down. Okay. There are, there are so many tools out there and new ones are coming out each day. Um, I try to keep up with that, but, um, it, and that's part of the reason that I love doing these floodings of the chat box, because I feel like People have tried so many, there's so many to share. Um, and so I would encourage all of you to continue to do that in your practice as well. So step three is your synchronous meetup. And that's what I like to refer to as the special sauce because students have already grappled with and reflected on content before this begins. You'll see engagement increase. These can be case studies, problem sets, practice exercises, performances, debates, student-led discussions to reinforce key ideas, checking for understanding, application of ideas, or further collaboration. This is where your students can take the lead. Step two can also take place during the synchronous meetup if there are high monitoring needs. You can use breakout rooms for this purpose. So this flipped process can be applied to different pedagogical models. I will share two more with you to help you stabilize your understanding, and you can choose whichever model resonates. The workshop model introduces four steps to learning, and the link for this is included in the webinar resources. The four steps are the opening, a mini lesson, work time, and a debriefing. You can learn more about this, as I said, using the link in your resources. So a little quiz time for our group now. Which parts of this would you flip to asynchronous learning. Think about that. If you want, you can type them into the chat box or you can just identify them. And I'm gonna pause just for a second and let people think about that. Which parts would you flip for asynchronous learning? And think back to the one, two, three steps of flipping the classroom. I'm seeing a lot of mini lesson and work time. Great, that's perfect. So everybody's beginning to think in a flipped way, which is exactly what we wanted to achieve. So the opening and mini lesson can both be part of a recorded screencast viewed asynchronously. Work time can begin asynchronously with an independent assignment or collaborative work, but can also extend to the synchronous meetup. The debriefing is perfect for the synchronous meetup using visible thinking routines or 
It can take place using a low bandwidth activity such as reflection journals. The latter would be asynchronous. Here's another model that can be applied to flipped learning, the BAM model. Deliver your direct instruction asynchronously, but keep it brief. Remember I said recorded videos um, based on evidence should not be more than six to 10 minutes in length. Facilitate peer-to-peer -peer interaction in an authentic way. Keep it meaningful by applying an accountability tool. This can be a low bandwidth activity such as visual thinking journals or Google Groups threaded discussions, low bandwidth collaborative documents, or high bandwidth activities such as student created content in Flipgrid, Padlet, or synchronous discussion forums. So again, I want to invite you to share what are your favorite digital tools to use for accountability? So go ahead and feel free to share in the chat box or questions. What are your favorite digital tools to use for accountability? And just so you all know, it's the questions box, not the chat box. Okay, so the one box. So it's okay. the questions box. Thank you, Karen. Sure. Lots of people are using Google Forms. Excellent. Google That's Classroom. The most widely accessible, simplest tool to use. Mm -hmm. And I see Edpuzzle here. Um, Google Classroom Turn In. Google Sheets. It says we use a credit update sheet. Interesting. Great, hey, good. So there's some additional ideas for the accountability piece. So any of these three models I've shown you all are just permutations on the theme of flipped learning. And I've shown three variations of it just so that there's at least one that resonates with you. I've mentioned visible thinking routines several times during the webinar. Some of you may be familiar with them. Thinking routines can be used to support student learning and thinking across age groups, disciplines, competencies, and populations. They are inherently engaging and paired with appropriate digital tools that can provide a rich structure for your remote teaching practice. I'd like to invite you now to use the link from your resources or search Project Zero Thinking Routines You'll come to a dashboard that is a digital toolbox of thinking routines categorized by types of thinking. Take a few minutes to explore this. While you do that, I'll tell you more about what's in the toolbox. All routines use a common template describing the purpose of the routine, offering potential applications for it, and often providing suggestions for its use and tips for getting started. The research project responsible for developing the routine is noted at the bottom of each page along with the copyright and licensing information as well as guidance about how to reference the routine. They invite and encourage educators to share their experiences using the routines. Each routine has a hashtag listed just above the reference info. And the great part is if you go to these on Twitter, you can see different ways educators have used each routine for more ideas. I recommend finding two routines that you would like to incorporate into your practice. Teach the processes using already learned content. Then apply them to a variety of lessons. Introduce new routines only when the current ones are stabilized and fluent amongst your class. Now I'm going to ask you to bring your attention back to the slide deck. You can explore the thinking routines more on your own. We're actually going to practice pairing a thinking routine with digital tools. This will help you to understand how you can apply these in remote learning. 
We'll first watch a four minute video about an instructor and how she used one routine in her face-to-face -face classroom. Listen carefully to what she did at each step. It will be important to choosing an appropriate digital tool. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. So a few years ago, I had the pleasure and honor of meeting Ron Richard from the Harvard University Graduate School of Education and one of the senior researchers on the Project Zero. Now, I had been using the visible thinking routines from his work, from Project Zero, and I actually have most of his books, so I'd been using them for quite a few years. However, once I actually attended his workshop, I realized that I wasn't using them as effectively as I could have. I had mainly been using the visible thinking routines as exit tickets. And there's nothing wrong with using them as exit tickets because they were wonderful ways for me to see students shift in thinking. I could formatively assess what they could understand and not understand, and then plan my subsequent lessons according to what their challenges were or what their feedback was. But what he taught me was, well, why don't we actually incorporate the visible thinking routine into the lesson so it's actually part of the lesson. So we ask our students to metacognitively reflect on their learning during the lesson and then the visible thinking routine is used as a vehicle to be able to promote discussion and help students to articulate their thinking and also their understanding. So let me give you an example of a visible thinking routine that I actually adapted for the classroom. So I love that routine, connect, extend, challenge. And in case you don't know it, connect means that you ask students, well, what were the ideas that actually connected to what you already knew? Extend means that you're gonna ask students, well, what has actually extended or pushed your thinking after this lesson or after the series of lessons? And then challenges that you ask your students, what are the challenges that you faced while you were actually learning about this topic? Now, I always like to add in a little fourth prompt, and that is, how do we overcome that challenge? So I like students to really think about what their challenges are and what they can do in a concrete way to actually overcome the challenge that they have. So what I do is I ask my students to complete these four prompts, connect, extend, challenge, and then overcome on four separate pieces of paper. And then I collect all of these pieces of paper into the four separate piles. I then ask students to group into groups of no more than six. If you have a big class, then maybe you can have two groups dealing with each pile. So let's say if I have a group of six that's looking at all the connects, I have a group of six that's looking at all the extends, a group that's looking at challenges, and then a group that's looking at overcome. Now, each group actually has the task of looking at all of the responses within the connects, as an example, and looking for themes and sorting them out into categories and you'd be really surprised at the themes and the commonalities that actually arise from looking at all the connects or all the extends, all the challenges and all the overcomes. Now what's really important is that after students in these groups have actually come up with these categories and themes that have emerged, you then ask one person from each group to form a new group. So the new group has four students, one student that was in the connect, one student in the extend, one student in the challenge, and the one student in the overcome. And you ask each of those students to feed back the major themes and the different main ideas that emerge from each of the connect, extend, challenge, and overcome. So I, I hope that you found this useful. Please don't forget to hit the subscribe button below and please Okay, I'm going to stop it there. Um, she's a lovely educator with lots of energy there. And um, I felt that the way that she explained the visible thinking routine um, that she conducts face to face would work very nicely for the activity today. So we're going to do an activity now to let you practice preparing a visible thinking routine for a remote learning lesson. Please access the activity worksheet through the link in the webinar resources. I have um, made it in view only, shared it in view only, so you will wanna make a copy of that if you actually wanna 
um, type into the document itself. Um, can I interrupt you for a sec? Yeah. Uh, so that this is this, oh, I'm sorry, Caroline, but they can access this through the handouts, right? Yes. Okay. Through so, the resources. Are there separate? Oh, yeah. Um, in the handouts under resources, yep. that's where you said you put the link for it. Correct, Karen? So, yep. Under the resource list, I mean, in the handouts, there's a um, document called resource list. If you click that and open it, uh, am I correct? That's in, right. Yep. And that there, this link to this activity is there. That's correct. And I think it's the second item down right under project zero visible thinking routines okay Citation. so folks are having a little trouble opening it um it doesn't look like it's live um the link does not open i'm getting no live okay let's see interesting um okay so i just opened the document and I see live resources, correct? Carolyn? Yeah, you've opened up your resource list. I've opened up, yep, from the handouts. Yeah. And um, how about? So, and I have it right here in front of me on the screen. And Let's see, and it looks like it is not opening up. So it looks like that may be a PDF. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can we copy the, ah, can't copy, yep. What if we copy the link and put it into Google? Maybe that would be yeah. a good solution. I'm gonna go back into presenter mode here. There we go. And the, um, the PDF there is also at the top of the screen. It's a pretty long one. So let me see, Karen, I probably am the only one with access to that. Is that right? Because I think. Here's my suggestion to you mm -hmm. is that you might want to download the document from the handouts, right? And keep this live and then show folks how they can copy the link from the handout and put it in a new window. Sure. Right, and that's I think the best way for them to access this. In other words, the links are blue, but they're not live. So what we need to do is open up the document from the handout, the resource list, and then copy that whole link into a new Google window. Okay, and Karen, did you want me to do that or did you want the participants to do that? I, I, maybe, I think the participants, but maybe you want to model it real quick. Sure. Okay, let me just exit full screen here. And I'm actually going to need to open up that resource. So I'll do that from my drive here. Okay, and here it is right here. Okay, and I'm gonna get the link. Oh, I think, I'm sorry, Carolyn. What I was saying is that to show the participants how to download the handout. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and unfortunately, um, let's see if I can get it. I am not, oh, there we go. Okay, that's the ribbon that wouldn't come down. So if you go into the upper right-hand side of the screen, you see the little download area arrow there, and you just click that then that should download it to your screen. And then you just open that up. And let's see, yeah, that's, that's still not gonna open it up, Karen, because I actually have the URL, it's still in PDF format. So I think the best thing for me to do is to actually just share, copy the link and put mm -hmm. that in the chat box. Sure. Well, um and then we can so let me do that i'm gonna put that in now and there it is 
So if people want to copy and paste that, or if you right click it, you can access it as well. And Karen, just let me know if people are having success with that. Yep, folks are doing great. Okay, good, good, good. Sorry about that, folks. Okay, we're good. Okay, good. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and begin talking a little bit here and I can slow down a repeat as needed. So we're gonna do an activity now to let you practice preparing a visible thinking routine for a remote learning lesson. So hopefully at this point you've accessed the activity worksheet. And you'll see that I've input already the different components of the instructor's visible thinking routine from the video. And they're in the second row entitled instructional component. I did add into that foundational knowledge introduced, which she sort of doesn't mention, she skips over, it's presumed um, to have happened. So what I'd like to invite you to do is to take a minute or so to decide what digital tool could be used for each portion of this visible thinking routine as part of a flipped, as part of flipped classroom instruction. So in the first column, the asynchronous is the asynchronous introduction of content. In the second column is the asynchronous independent and collaborative engagement. And in the third column is the synchronous special sauce. So I've typed in for you just to help you out all of the different components that the instructor described in her video. And I spread them out in that second row across the three parts of flipped learning that we've introduced. So I'm going to just be silent for a moment and let you guys think for a minute about what digital tools you would use for each of those components. Then I'll come back on and I'll share my thoughts. Carolyn, are we supposed to be able to write into it? Yeah, if people make a copy of it, then they should be able to type into it. Okay. Okay. Otherwise, you can just look at it and you can just jot it down on a piece of paper. And just as a heads up, there might be more than one digital tool that you use for the different components. You might pair up tools. So again, thinking, what would you use for the asynchronous direct instruction of content where you introduce foundational knowledge. What would you use for the asynchronous engagement opportunity where you have both an independent component where the instructor had students complete responses to four prompts on four separate pieces of paper. Then she also had a collaborative component where she sorts those by category and group students accordingly. Then the students work collaboratively to look for threads, themes, and salient issues according to their assigned category. Then finally, for the synchronous portion, where the instructor and students come together, one from each group forms a new group and shares their common threads. Then I added in a little piece, I would, if I was the instructor, bring everyone back together to debrief, or I would have students work in reflection journals. She did not mention that, but I added that in with the asterisk.
Okay, so hopefully you've um, jotted down a few digital tool ideas. There are so many tools, honestly, that can be used um, for these, but um, I'm going to go ahead and give you some suggestions of what I would use. And I'm going to talk about tools that um, are probably universally um, available um, to you folks. They're not necessarily the best tools for it. Um, but I wanted to present it that way so that um, you feel like you can walk away with something you can do. So to introduce the content, I would use a screencasting tool such as Loom or incorporate prepared video content from an open educational resource. And that could be, again, like Edpuzzle or Khan Academy. For independent engagement, we're in the middle column now. I would have students respond to each of the four prompts using a Google form. And I'm curious if other people came up with that idea as well. That way, the responses can easily be sorted for the next step because, as we know, Google Forms automatically puts responses into a sheet if you enable that. So that would be an easy way then to resort the information. For the collaborative engagement, I would have students work on Jamboard or a simple Google Doc with the responses for their prompt uploaded to it, to either of those tools on a PDF from the Google Forms response sheet. Students can then use annotation tools to collaborate and find common themes. Finally, for the synchronous special sauce, I'd use Zoom breakout rooms for sharing and coming together to debrief. And I recognize that um, there are many school districts that do not use Zoom, but use Google Hangouts instead. Google Hangouts to date, as far as I know, does not have a breakout room option. I know they are planning on incorporating that at some point in the near future. But what you can do in that case is you can create separate Hangouts for each of the groups and you as the instructor can move between those. So that's just a workaround for breakout rooms. As I said, you may have tools that you prefer. However, if you were unsure, you can consider my suggestions here. Carolyn, I just wanted to let you know that um, Google Meet has breakout rooms now. Excellent. Okay, I knew they were planning on incorporating yeah. that. So that's, that was kind of released this month, I think. Good. So I would say go with that since that is a school approved tool. And just on a note, um, just as a little bit of a disclaimer, but um, you would anything mentioned tonight, either by someone else in the chat box or from me, you would always want to make sure that that tool is on your school approved digital tool list. Um, that's important. Schools keep those lists in order to make sure that they comply with FERPA. Um, so make sure that any tools mentioned are on your approved list at your school. So I hope that activity was helpful to you to begin to wrap your head around implementation and remote learning. I want to take a few minutes as a sort of public service to address a fixed commodity that is at risk, and that is bandwidth. First of all, there are issues of equity raised for students who don't have bandwidth access. But that aside, with education institutions as well as businesses using it in increasing amounts, we may find that it is not always avail available for our synchronous meetups. We need to become ethical users of and equitable players with bandwidth. I want to share this bandwidth immediacy matrix with you. It's organized horizontally from low to high immediacy, which points to the need for either asynchronous or synchronous choices. On the vertical, it's organized from high to low bandwidth demands. In each of the boxes are communication types in the category that they fall into. The green and blue boxes we can also think of as low-tech options, which are more equitable for some of our families. They also use less bandwidth. So consider this also in your digital tool choices. 
It's also another merit of asynchronous learning and could well result in an increase of asynchronous learning in the near future. So on that note, I want to say thank you so much for your time tonight. I know you're tired. I hope that this has been helpful to you and maybe has breathed a little bit of inspiration back into your professional practice. Karen, thank you. That's what I have, but I'm happy to answer questions. I know that um, I was emailed some questions ahead of time um, that people had um, sent to demonstrate success when they registered. So Karen, how would you like to proceed with that? Um, did and Has Beth sent you that list? She has, and I have it in front of me. Sure, well, why don't you sort of embark on them? That would be fabulous. Okay, sure. So there were two questions that were similar, and from what I can interpret, they have to do with parallel instruction which is where you are synchronously teaching both remotely and in person at the same time. And the questions were basically, what are the, what, oops, I heard a Okay, and the question was for at least two people, how, what is the best practice for handling this? And I was actually glad that these questions came up because I recently um, worked with a school district to come up with a model for parallel instruction. And I did that in collaboration with um, Dr. Cheryl Sawin, who I mentioned earlier in the program. And we actually have come up with a model that we've decided to call Agile Pedagogy. And we're hoping to get some feedback from the district on how it worked. But I'd like to go ahead and just share with the group tonight what we've proposed. So <clears throat> picture yourself in your classroom and you are, or if your classroom is in your home, um, wherever it is, and you are, well, you wouldn't have students in your home, so let me back up. This question really just pertains to people who are actually in their classroom with students or and teaching remotely at the same time. So what you would wanna do is plan for remote implement as if everyone is remote. So this is how you would do that. Instead of using your own whiteboard or a smaller whiteboard that you might put in front of your computer screen, you need to use a digital whiteboard. And ones that are available to you are Jamboard, um, there's one on, on Zoom, Google Hangouts, I believe, has one you can use. Kami has a digital whiteboard. So you would need to use a digital whiteboard. You would actually be instructing to your device. You would have the students who are in the classroom log into their devices as well. And they're going to operate as if they were remote, even though they are in person. You would want to have them bring earbuds with them um, or a headset and be plugged in with that and to mute their mic. And that's how we can actually make this work um, and incorporate best practices at the same time. I'm hearing a lot of um, feedback from students and families who are saying that um, teachers are um, instructing with their back turned to the students using their whiteboard in their classroom or or writing on a smaller whiteboard and holding it up to the screen and it um, that is just a practice that is going to be difficult for those students who are remote um, so this is the model that we're recommending um, and we are in the process of getting feedback from school districts on that okay um, you are actually doing a webinar later this month uh, around that Agile pedagogy. So That's I just right. want to let, let folks know that. Okay, excellent. And at that um, webinar, I'll be going into some of the practices in greater detail for that. So another question is, how can I annotate on generated PDFs and have them submitted via Google Classroom? So, um, Generated PDFs can be annotated. You can actually upload them into Jamboard 
or the um, Google app extension called Kami, which is K-A-M-I. Kami happens to be one of my favorites. And those are probably the best open resource annotate, well, uh, I'm sorry, Jamboard is not open resource. It comes as part of the suite, but it's widely available. Kami is an open resource with a subscription upgrade. Um, it's a very strong tool for uploading PDFs, annotating them. And then what you do is you actually download the, them again into a PDF that includes the annotations, and then those can be submitted via Google Classroom. There are other annotative tools as well. Those are just two that I recommend. Okay, another question, I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead. So, yeah. well, just before I told you to embark on the questions, are there yeah. tons of questions? <laughs> um, there are four more. Okay, so I just wanna, I wanna acknowledge that, that our timing here, um, it's 418 and yes, we normally would, and the webinar now, but if there's only four more questions, I think I'm gonna let us go and you can talk through those that you feel that you can address. And then Paul is gonna come back on for one minute and um, and then we're good to go. So if folks can hang on, that's fabulous. We're happy to have you. And if you need to get off, don't worry about it, go for it. Okay. Okay, fair enough. So I'll just proceed forward and try and be as concise as I can. Um, another question um, pertained to how to balance technology with low-tech, non-tech learning activities. And um, the answer to this is, well, we have the bandwidth immediacy matrix here, which shows you um, some low-tech um, options, which are in the green and blue box. And I think the question is more though, how how do you offer, uh, you need to offer a variety of options is really the answer to it. And it's just, if you think about universal design for learning, you always want to offer multiple modalities for engagement um, or content access or generating um, knowledge. Um, so you want to have the same approach with regard to um, high-tech, low-tech, and no-tech options. No-tech options would be um, sending home a packet, um, and as um, primitive and rudimentary as that sounds, that is a low-tech or a no-tech option for some families that have no access to technology. Um, low-tech, again, would be the ones in the green and blue boxes, and then high-tech are going to be your synchronous tools. Um, and so again, you need to make sure all of those options are available to your learners for, for any given activity. How to best foster discussion among students. Um, so increasing student engagement, hopefully I've given you some tools for that tonight, both in how I've modeled in the webinar and also with the Project Zero Visible Thinking Routines. Those are huge um, tools for fostering discussion and engagement. Google Groups, um, which should be available to all of you, is a threaded discussion tool that you can use. Um, we are going to have some additional webinars that focus specifically on engagement um, and, and including diverse learners. Those will be coming up um, later in the fall. I'm going to jump in there, uh, Carolyn, because on Friday, we were actually having a webinar on um, creating a connected learning community as right. part of our paid subscription. So I, I do just want to say, because a couple of people have written in asking about the Agile pedagogy, um, you know, get in touch with us and um, or speak to your administrator to, um, to talk about how you can get involved. That would be great. Super. I just had the very last question, Karen, had to do with math, and it was student math engagement for grades seven to eight is paramount to learning. How can this be achieved remotely with group work? And I would say briefly, use collaborative tools like Jamboard and Kami that have these nice um, grid paper that you can um, put on the screen and have students work collaboratively using annotative tools. In addition, um, the national there is a national library of virtual manipulatives, which I will add to the resources, um, the URL for that, um, where they have hundreds of virtual manipulatives um, that can be available for math instruction, and that can also increase engagement. 
Karen. That's all the questions that I have. Okay. I'm excited to hear you talk about the national, what was it called? The National Resource for Na Virtual Nation National Library of Virtual Manipulatives. Um, I am sure that we will be covering that because, and also this is like you're a plant, Carolyn, but um, in at the end of September, at the beginning of October, Heather Jenkins on our team is going to be using, is going to be doing a webinar on um, virtual manipulatives. So that'll be really fun too. Excellent. <laughs> but you're not a plant. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you, Carolyn. That was really informative and we appreciate it immensely. Um, I think that Paula is, and I just want to say, folks, I will be sending out any questions and the lists of resources along with the PowerPoint and along with the link to the video and the resource page and everything. If you have signed on, you will be getting everything that you are entitled to via email within 24 to 48 hours. And if you don't, please contact me. Okay, so because we're super happy to have you. Um, and I'm going to bring it back to Paula now. I think she wants to end out the webinar. So Paula, are you here to be with us? I certainly am. Hi. Um, I do, if you can, thank you. You brought me to the right slide. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, that is an example of just one of the 20 webinars that are part of our remote learning PD package. Um, Carolyn, as she mentioned, will be featured throughout the 20 webinars. Um, as you can see, she's such a valuable resource. And um, we do hope you walked away today with something you can use in your classroom. Um, and that is our ultimate goal. Regarding the, the program itself, um, you know, a program is only as effective as the communication piece around it. So we want you to know whether you're not, whether you're an administrator listening today or an educator that our team is responsible for all the communications so that you can proper, be proper, properly aware of when a webinar is taking place, how you can register, and how you can access the resources after. Um, our next webinar is taking place on Friday. This, this one here kicked off the program. Uh, our next one will take place on Friday, and it'll, they will take place two times a week thereafter. Um, and we are accepting subscriptions through the end of the month. Um, and you will have access to any of the uh, presentations that you may have missed. Um, it's important that if you can't attend a webinar to know that they are available, they'll be recorded for those um, schools that are subscribing. Cost, I know, is something for um, schools to consider. We have priced it out so this can be a very affordable option. Um, for schools and to make it accessible to all their educators. Um, so it starts from the, uh, the educator program begins at $2,000 and goes upward depending on the size of your school. Early on, I mentioned that there's a similar parent program and similarly that begins at $2,000 um, and um, increases depending on the size of the school. So if you are interested and would like to hear more, um, Karen, if you can go to the next slide, please. You can contact Mike Schwartz, our company president, at Mike Schwartz, Mike.Schwartz at demonstratedsuccess.com, or Karen, who you've gotten to know very well today, at Karen.Matzo at demonstratedsuccess.com. And if you're interested in learning more, you can always visit our, de our website at demonstratedsuccess.com. And uh, thank you all for coming and participating and learning today with us. And thank you. And um, it was great to be with you all today. And thanks, Carolyn. And thanks everyone be well. And maybe I just think that it's a lovely day as an aside and everyone should go out and do something outside. <laughs> All right. For the evening. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a good afternoon.